In 1957, a 33 year old writer for the first time entered the Madras State Assembly. He had come elected from the Kullithallai constituency. A poet and an established scriptwriter of the Tamil film industry. Since that day and since that election, this politician never lost another election ever. A record spanning six decades that will be hard to beat. Muttuvel Karunanidhi never finished school because it was politics and fighting for Tamil rights that attracted him to the bullpen of activism. By the time he was 14, Karunanidhi was well entrenched in the anti-Hindi, anti-North India movement taking root in the Tamil-dominated Madras Presidency of British India. Muttuvel Karunanidhi was not the name his parents had given him. He was named Dakshinamurthy by his parents, who were not of Tamil extraction, but were descended from Telugu ancestry. Yet Karunanidhi always thought of himself to be a Tamilian, and he fought for the recognition of the language and its connected identity. From early in life, Karunanidhi built his life championing the Tamil legacy. He based his career around it. His failure to clear his class 10 exams led to Karunanidhi writing for a local theatre company. A young boy full of wit and charm, his stories soon won him several admirers. And one of them happened to be the Anna, or big brother of Dravidian identity, C.N. Annadurai. It was Anna who encouraged the young lad to write more and to speak at public gatherings. It was because of Anna Durai's patronage that Karunanidhi got his first job as an editor of the Dravida Karagam party magazine, Kudyarasu, while continuing to write for theatre. It was Karunanidhi's mentor, Anna Durai, who drummed into him the vast potential for mass communication that films and theatre provided. The idea was to channel the fan following of the arts medium into the arena of politics. When uh, Mr. Karnanidhi started uh, writing in late 40s, but it was films like Parashakti, which give him uh, the kind of uh, reach. And then he used MGR as a tool, virtually as a tool, because MGR had charisma. And uh, when MGR delivers a line, in the, the, those days when there was cinema was the only form of entertainment and there were thousands of people hooked on to cinema. I'm speaking about from 50s to let's say about early 60s. Uh, they fell for it in the sense that he, through his uh, dialogues he could attract the layman the, and the education level was almost uh, nil at that time. Karunanidhi was later to go on to write dialogue for a Tamil movie that became famous in its manifestation of the type of politics that Karunanidhi was to practice. He wrote, Aruhara yendra makkal kural andavana yittinal poodadhi arasangatta yetta vindu. Or that, it is not enough for the voice of the people chanting Arora to reach God. It must reach the government. <laughs> The young Karunanidhi founded a student organization, which was the first student wing of the Dravidian movement. He also started a newspaper for its members, which eventually grew into Murasoli, the official newspaper of Dravida Munayatra Kadagam or DMK. Murasoli uh, was was entirely Karunanadhi's baby. 
in the sense that he started it and it was to spread the ideology not just of Periyar but also of Anadurai. So it was a, a very clearly a mouthpiece for the Dravidian movement. It was a mouthpiece that uh, you know that proliferated, that propagated the anti-Hindi movement of the time. And um, and Karunanidhi's um, literary skills are legendary, and everybody of course knows this. His knowledge, his grasp, and his use of Tamil uh, has stood him in great stead, and has ensured that uh, uh, his whatever he touched has turned into a mass movement in Tamil Nadu. And that is where uh, Karunanidhi's uh, you know biggest strength lies that he could that he was able to connect with the masses in their own language. Karunanidhi firmly became part of the anti-North India, anti-Brahmin and pro-Dravida movement that was raging across Madras Presidency. Led by the doyen of Tamil politics, Periyar, and his lieutenant, Annadurai, Karunanidhi was part of the struggle when the Dravida movement was still finding its feet. It was a very, very sort of humble beginning. And uh, this was in a village called Tirukkuvalai, which is now in Tiruvarur district. And uh, Karnanadi writes of how he sort of takes after his father in that sense, where, uh, uh, you know, his, his love for, uh, you know, the written word. His father used to write little ditties on uh, local scandals, you know, about how uh, women were, you know, married women were running away with other men where uh, men were sleeping around with other women. So uh, the local scandals were composed into very witty kind of songs. Um, and there is a strong hint of feminism in what Karnandi's father has also written. Um, and this is uh, perhaps something that has been passed on to Karunanidhi and has influenced him to a large extent. Muttuvel Karunanidhi formally entered the world of cinema at the age of 20, egged on by Anna Durai, who himself had written stories and scripts for Tamil films. Contracted by the Jupiter Picture Company, Karunanidhi wrote his first film script for the film Rajakumari. And the lead actor of that film was M.G. Ramachandran, who would later become famous as M.G.R. And together, Annadurai, M.G.R. and Karunanidhi would dominate Tamil politics for the decades to come. For Karunanidhi, more than the uh, independence of India, his priorities were the language of Tamil and the improvement of Tamil Nadu, etc., etc., you can say that. Uh, in a sense, it is a very interesting development that uh, when the whole of India was on the move and there were several thousands of freedom fighters from Tamil Nadu itself, uh, parallelly the Dravidar Kairagam uh, was functioning mainly for social issues like self-respect, uh, reservation for Tamils, importance for Tamil language and other things. By the time India became independent, the Dravida movement was headed for an acrimonious breakup. The seeds had been laid in 1940, when at a secession conference, the idea of a Dravida Nadu was first floated. But by 1941, the unquestioned leader of the movement, Periyar, suspended all political agitation against the British to extend cooperation to them during the Second World War. This was when Annadurai and Periyar began to drift apart. And along with Annadurai, so did his protege, the young and impressionable Karunanidhi. Karunanidhi, he himself is an uh, voracious reader and a writer and in the year 1942, he has started uh, the party's official organ, Morasoli, which is functioning even today. Mm -hmm. And he just started it from uh, uh, writing, handwriting on the papers. That's called the, what we call it in Tamil as Kayal Pridi, that is handwritten paper. After independence in 1949, um, uh, uh, a very large section of uh, Dravidar Karagam workers uh, split away from their parent body, that is DMK, and, and formed a new political party called the DMK. By 1949, Periyar's Dravidian movement had split, and Karunanidhi joined hands with Annadurai to help in the founding of the Dravida Munayatra Karagam or the DMK.
the original party of Periyar, the Dravida Karagam or DK slowly faded away, leaving the DMK as the main defender of Tamil sentiment. Karunanidhi was part of this journey and his first official role in the party that he was to have such an influence on for the next seven decades was that of the party treasurer. As the decade of the 1960s dawned, Karunanidhi became the deputy leader of the opposition in the Tamil Nadu Assembly, cementing his place as the number two in Dravida politics after Annadurai. Also by this time, not only was he an already established name in Tamil politics, but also in the Tamil film industry. Karunanidhi's films were largely historical and social stories, which propagated a reformist view of society. They also faced the wrath of the establishment in the form of censorship. Two of his plays in the 1950s were banned. On screen, Karunanidhi's scripts had begun producing blockbusters the most significant being Parasakti. And that too was a film that had initially been banned by the government. But when the ban was eventually lifted, the film was a blockbuster hit in 1952. It was also a trendsetter of sorts. Because before that, you see Tamil cinema is full of historicals historicals or some mythology movies and nobody thought it as a medium where you could capture power that Mr. Karnanithi saw it with. So in a way the powerful dialogues of uh, Parashakti, remember that film was also censored for its, uh, it had censor problems because of the writings of Mr. Karnanithi. But uh, later the film turned out to be such a blockbuster. Parashakti was a turning point in Tamil cinema and advocated the ideology of the Dravidian movement. It struck a chord with the masses as it struck a blow against dominant Brahminism. In 1967, when the DMK came to power for the first time, Karunanidhi became Minister for Public Works. And two years later, in 1969, he became the Chief Minister when his mentor, until then Chief Minister of Madras State, Anna Durai, died. The tussle for the top spot within the DMK was a straight fight between Karunanidhi and V. R. Nedunsarian, who was the acting Chief Minister on the demise of Anna Durai. With the backing of MLAs like MGR, it was Karunanidhi who finally took control and became Chief Minister. It was a coup of sorts because uh, five prominent leaders were at, at that time handling the DMK's efforts uh, like Nadine Jarian, uh, Madhi Arjagan and a few others. Karunanidhi was not one among the five, number one. Number two, Karunanidhi, those five people belonged to a very, very dominant backward community called the Mudaliyars. Mm. But Karunanidhi did not belong to that community. He came from a very, very, as I told you that, Isai Vailalar community, which is a little bit ahead of the uh, uh, scheduled caste people as far as the social strata is concerned. Another thing is that all those five people are highly educated. They were, they, all of them got MA degrees. Some of them are double MA degrees, postgraduates. But Karunanidhi was just a school dropout. It was with his sheer political acumen. He actually, you know, pushed back them and he captured the power. When the DMK split from the DK, Anadurai structured the new party without the post of a president in it. Anadurai, as the general secretary, had announced that only Periyar had the right to the post of president. Until Periyar joined the party, there would be no president of the Dravida Muneyatra Karagam. M. Karunanidhi became the president of the DMK, even as he became the chief minister for the first time. In a sense, it is inevitable that uh, the Dravidian movement ideology would get diluted once 
uh, it got into electoral politics and remember this is what Periyar wanted to avoid he wanted to keep this as pure ideology and uh, without any sort of uh, politics involved because he probably knew that once you get into electoral politics then caste equations religious equations class equations all of these come into play and the ideology would have to be diluted in order to fight an electoral battle and win it you would have to please caste uh, castes and communities you know caste groups and communities and uh, you would have to go out of your way to uh, ensure that all of their demands are met which would dilute the ideals of atheism uh, the breaking down of caste barriers and uh, also uh, you know egalitarianism all of these would be broken down once you get into electoral politics so i would not say karunanadi is uh, the heir for periyar but most certainly he is anadure's heir with the death of Annadure, Karunanidhi got increasingly occupied with his political career. And along with his longtime friend, MJR, he set about stamping his dominance over the party. But in 1972, in the biggest shake-up since Periyar and Annadure split more than two decades ago, MJR broke with Karunanidhi. The partnership between the hero and the writer came to an end when the General Secretary of the DMK, MGR, accused the President of the party, M. Karunanidhi, of corruption and demanded verification of party accounts and declaration of assets of prominent DMK men. In response, Karunanidhi ordered his suspension from the party. In 1976, during the period of emergency, the Karunanidhi-led DMK government was dismissed and Tamil Nadu put under President's rule. When the emergency was lifted, it was Karunanidhi's friend turned foe, MGR, and his newly formed AIA-DMK that won the elections of 1977. Both Annadurai and Karunanidhi had seen the potential in MGR to spread the message of Dravidian ideology through films. A series of super hit films penned by Karunanidhi had MGR in the lead. And so when MGR broke away from the DMK, it was possibly the biggest setback in Karunanidhi's political career. Also, MGR's popularity with the masses was such that till he lived, Karunanidhi and his DMK never managed to get back power in Tamil Nadu. As long as MGR was alive, actually if you really look at it, it, that, that image that MGR has the do-gooder and you know all and the kind of movies that he did the image that came across was a creation of uh, largely a creation of Mr. Karnanidhi but for 10 years when MGR was in power Mr. Karnanidhi could never come back to uh, become the chief minister only after MGR's death in the subsequent elections he could come to power. In 1987, when MJR died of a heart attack, his friend M. Karunanidhi is said to have cried all day. The death of MJR in December 1987 and the power vacuum that it created in the AIA DMK came as a breather for Karunanidhi. And he again managed to steer the DMK back to power in 1989. On 25th of March, 1989, as Karunanidhi stood up to present the budget on the floor of the house, the leader of the opposition and MJR's protege, J. Jayalalitha of the AIA DMK, accused him of being a criminal. A ruckus broke out between AIA DMK and DMK, forcing the speaker to adjourn the house. When Jayalalitha exited the assembly, she was disheveled and weeping and accused a DMK leader of trying to disrobe her. And so did another political rival of Karunanidhi take birth. In 1991, 
Karunanidhi's government was again dismissed by the centre, this time because of Delhi accusing him of going soft on the LTTE. Although he was a very firm and strong and vocal supporter of the Tamil Yiram cause, um, he was not in favour of using arms and of, you know, uh, sending out suicide bombers, uh, all of this. But he did play a very large role in um, providing san sanctuary for uh, people who were being hunted down in Sri Lanka, LTT, um, uh, you know, Kada who were being hunted down in Sri Lanka. So Tamil Nadu sort of became a safe haven for uh, a number of people who were wanted by the Sinhalese uh, police in Sri Lanka. They would find a safe haven in Tamil Nadu. So in that sense, yes. In 1991, when elections were again held for the state assembly, it was Jayalalitha who brought the AIADMK back to power. The elections were held soon after Rajiv Gandhi's assassination by the LTTE. The public mood was against the DMK, which had been sympathetic to the Tamil militant outfit from Sri Lanka. The AIADMK took 224 seats and the DMK managed just seven. One of them, that of Karunanidhi. For the next four elections spanning the following two decades, the people of Tamil Nadu alternatively gave full terms to Jayalalitha and Karunanidhi in rotation. As after all the saying goes for ages that everything is good in love and war. You must be a, if you want to be a successful politician, you, you must have that animal spirit, that killer spirit to capture power by hook or crook and do everything once you capture power, do everything to sustain that power. So, in that sense, Karnanadi is an actual politician. Other than even, I can go far as to say, other, even bypassing uh, Anna or his uh, uh, great enemy of sorts, MGR. In 2001, a month after Jayalalitha settled in the chief minister's chair for her second stint, she ordered a midnight raid on DMK leaders. Tamil Nadu woke up the next morning to news and visuals of Karunanidhi being dragged from his house and being arrested by the Tamil Nadu police in connection with the flyover scam. The Jayalalitha versus Karunanidhi rivalry had taken a step for the worse and the impact on Tamil politics had its bearing on national politics as well, where the AIA DMK was aligned to the BJP-led NDA and the DMK was allied to the Congress-led UPA. In 2010, the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, Vinod Rai, filed a report on the irregularities in the allocation of 2G telecom spectrum and licenses. And it was the 2G scam that hit the DMK patriarch, Karunanidhi, where it hurt the most. His daughter and DMK MP, Kannimori, and the Union Telecom Minister, a. Raja were implicated in the case. The DMK's influence and power at the centre had sunk to an all-time low and in Tamil Nadu too, it became very difficult for the octogenarian Karunanidhi and his Dravida Munayatra Karagam to hold on to power. Not only has indulged in uh, blatant, uh, brazen, uh, knackered family politics, he also justified it. So that's why he was defeated in 2011. In the 2011 elections, AIA DMK was back and since then managed to keep the DMK out of the government. Karunanidhi's failing health and the feud over who his successor should be has not helped the party's political fortunes. The falling out of elder son Aragiri led to younger son Stalin assuming the mantle of the successor. But for anyone coming in to fill his sandals, it would still be an uphill task to match the brightness of the poet-politician, who for more than half a century had been the all-powerful, charismatic and dominant master of the rising sun.
Thanks for watching the video. For more such news and updates, please like, share and subscribe to India Today. Also check out our other great videos from our channel. We know you would love to.